All right, well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Doug. Uh, Doug is the CEO and founder of Legacy Power, and we're here in your amazing office building here on the sixth floor of the uh, community credit union center, Dan. Yeah, it's, it's exciting to be here, and welcome, man. Congrats on everything that you've been up to. It's, it's fun to watch and follow your podcasts and your social media. It's awesome to see this influencer, man. Well, it's funny because we met, we just put this together, but I mean, obviously, you, you know, what you've done now is just exceptional. You guys are the number one solar company um, in the world, I believe, in the United States. Yeah, privately held, number one, for uh, sure. Excellent, and um, I mean, you've built this thing. I remember when you called me when you first were gonna start it up. Um, we'll get into that story a little bit more, but and I remember thinking to myself, why is he taking this on? Just be like, I, to me, it was such a risk, but to see where you've gone, it's really been inspiring. Um, it's been really cool to watch just from the sidelines, uh, but also, um, we met, we just put this together, we, we met just, back yeah, in high school, dude. I know, we should tell this story. Well, <laughs> it's kind of a bitter point for me, but I think it's important because, long story short, Doug played for Mountain Crest High School uh, in 2000, 1999, 2000, and we played against you guys in the state tournament. Baseball was my life growing up, you have to understand. By the way, and for me as well, yeah. it's like, grew up on the baseball and field. We were two of the top teams my junior year, your junior year, uh, and we got to the semifinal game and we beat you guys three to two. It was uh, close. It was close. And then you guys fought through the losers bracket, won like four or five games in a uh -huh. row, and then we got to play again. And I remember you were kind of like the team we didn't want to play again because we yeah. knew we, you know, we won, but it was a, it was a battle. And uh, well, you remember the night prior? Hey, yeah. I mean, I mean, I remember com you guys had beat us, right? So it's like going up against somebody that had beaten you, you. You're playing mind games or whatever else. We came to play and. Yeah, we lost. Sorry. I actually, made, I actually made the last out of that game. And there's a picture somebody took of me, like, with my head down right after I grounded out, I think. And uh, I, I have my head down, and the scoreboard's in the background. You can tell that the game just you ended. Can, and I actually cut that picture out and kept it in my wallet for a year uh, awesome. trying to motivate me for my senior season. You should look back at the stat line. I don't remember <laughs> now. <but> <laughs> anyway, but you guys ended up winning the state tournament. Yeah, we did. Went on, and, and uh, what an... You know, it's, it's sort of a sign of things to come because, you know, fighting back through that, I remember that. It's a defining moment in my life of going back and fighting through adversity and, you know, to go through the, the pitching that has to happen, the team, how you have to come together to fight all the way back. And, and you had to win about something. five or six games in a row once you lost. Yeah, it was I crazy think. to come back through and then, you know, and then uh, to win back-to-back -back games, have to beat the team twice, and your pitching's all, all done and everything else. So it was, it was awesome to see us come together, and something I'll always remember. Dude, I love that. Well, you kind of have that history, too, of, you know, you build towards something, have some adversity fall into your path, and then you come out of that on top. You've done that multiple times now. Um, I know you started at Atlas, which is where a lot of, here in the Utah, the summer sales industry is huge. There's some huge companies that employ, I swear, half of the population of the college students here in, in the state. Yeah, tons. Um, but you started at that Atlas. Can you tell us a little bit, because I know that you had, things were going really well, and then it kind of all fell apart. Yeah, I mean, the short version is this company grew like crazy. We became the 143rd fastest growing company in the country. Um, Inc. 500, you know, you're, you're getting all this recognition and I started off as a sales rep, became a sales manager, you know, sort of went through the ranks and found myself as president of sales of that business. Worked with a lot of great people in the industry that are still in the industry today and suddenly that came crashing down. Uh, the owner ended up getting involved in some real estate that went south. Um, you got involved like a Ponzi scheme or something. Yeah, it just went south. and, and uh, so he lost a whole bunch of money, I think 30 or $40 million gone of other people's money. So a lot of the salespeople had invested their money. Um, I invested a half million dollars at that point. At age, what age were you at that point? 25-ish, 26. <laughs> I mean, like this is, yeah, like this is like exists. everything. I'd lived frugally, I'd saved, I want to be a real estate investor, put it in this hard money lending, didn't know certain things that I should have or whatever else. And there's, you know, some, some challenges there, but lost it all. I mean, all of that go is gone. My, uh, you know, family members. My father-in-law became um, ended up being a a lot loan investor, and he ended up losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. And 
like my father lost money and family members. And so it was a hard time. So not only you lost all your money, but you had gotten other people involved. Or like, you, yeah, yeah, in it's trouble, you were, yeah, and it's, yeah, exactly. I had a similar experience. I lost 50,000 in a, you know, the same time. Yeah, it's yeah, probably I the mean, same. It's hard. And if you weren't going through that at the time, I don't think you truly understand. Like money was just flowing. Money was coming in. Everyone was making I mean, money. For the real estate, right? Yeah, yeah, we're nothing's ever going to change. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'd been told, I remember sitting down with multiple financial advisors that literally said, Jimmy, you can't lose with real estate. It's never gone down in value, right? So I'm thinking, I'm 25. I've read yeah. enough books about Go this. Yeah, yeah, so I was, I want to be retired by 30. Yeah. I was, I did the same thing. I, you know, I was a little bit more diversified, but if you never went through that, I think it's hard to understand just how crazy it got. Yeah, I mean, my life was president of sales, fast growing company, investor in real estate, making good money, driving fancy cars, living in nice homes, like thinking that was it and, and kind of naive and suddenly you lose your job, you lose your money, the real estate market crashes and you're sitting like staring at bankruptcy. Now I, I didn't file luckily and fought my way out, but then you're faced with like a, a, a situation. What do you do? It's like this social experiment. When hard things happen, how do you respond? Do you curl up into a ball and, and does it paralyze you from taking action or do you go get back to work? And, and fortunately, me and a lot of others were able to just put our heads down and go back to work. Did you see some guys that, because a lot of people went through the same thing, did you see yeah. some guys that didn't come out of that? Absolutely, Jimmy. I mean, that, that's the side that's really interesting to look now in retrospect and see the decisions people make and look at where they're at today. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, very fascinating and some go the safe, secure, sort of job, you know, even government job or whatever else, thinking that security lies in a job when I think security lies in your ability to produce, but you kind of lose that uh, amidst, you know, sort of struggles versus buckling down and getting after it. So how hard of a decision was that to try to fight through that as opposed to taking an easier route out or maybe a safer route? Yeah, I, I think that's that's just it. Some people are wired certain ways and, and for me it's it's kind of all or nothing. I'm kind of like the the switch flips and I'm, I'm all in on something. And uh, I think that's what's helped me be successful. At, you know, whether it's adversity, whether it's having to go up against, uh, you know, Murray High School, um, <laughs> and again, and, and you'd lost to him, or if it's going out and facing, you know, different challenges, whether the market turns or whatever it might be, but, but fighting back and standing up for what you know you believe in. So after that fell apart, I mean, you were probably not only dealing with family things, friends, you had all these coworkers as well that were out of work. So how did you decide what to do next? Did you take some time and really put some thought into it or did you jump right back into something else? It was emotional, man. I mean, people lose money. How do people handle that? Like whether it's personal or you, you invite somebody to invest somewhere or something like something, you know, and then they lose money and they hold it personal. So there were like strained relationships through that time period. And that was hard. And it took years to like rebuild trust in some of those relationships, even though I hadn't lost their money, right? Well, um, I, I, I had a similar experience. I had a buddy when I did my meat company, we ended up losing yeah. all of our money. I, our partner was, same thing, was kind of throwing the money away and things like that. But, and he'd come to me and begged me to invest. He right. put 40, 50 grand or something into the company on a credit card and when we lost it all, you know, he was so bitter and he was so depressed. I finally told him, I said, once I pay back the 120 that I lost, I'll pay you back your 40. Yeah. But I, I think I was literally nervous that he was going to off himself or something. I was right. really worried for the guy. Yeah. And he ended up filing bankruptcy and kind of never got out of that funk. It was very interesting to watch. I, we ended up later, you know, gave him the money and everything, but it was just crazy to me to watch him, right. how he handled that situation. So I, and that's the human scale. that's the human behavior side that I'm talking about though and I think that's a principle we can take and I hope everybody can take is like when hard things happen maybe it's not losing money but hard things happen to all of us we're all humans mm -hmm. it might be man maybe it's chemical imbalance maybe it's a relationship maybe it's a death maybe it's something financial but hard things happen I think that's what all successful people do yourself, we could relate it to any of the people that you've interviewed or anybody. When the hard things happen, how do you respond and do you get back up the next day and get going again? And I think that's just like that principle you have to be focused on. When you, and your story is unique because you, I mean, you were at the top young and then you got knocked down yeah. really bad and then you built it back up big again. And when you knocked down again. But I want to talk about that second 
basically yeah. section of right. So story. I got involved in the home security industry. Great industry. I'm super grateful for all the companies and leaders and great friends that I've worked with. You know, I was at Pinnacle Security for five years and um, was the top region my first year. Went out and sold personally. You know, it's it's like you're down. What are you gonna do? Uh, called a mentor of mine, Chris Monday. He was the CEO at the time, and I said, Chris, what should I do? And I ended up joining Pinnacle, and, and uh, that first year, you're switching industries. They we're naysayers, man. Like, you've done this, sold this product. It's This is way harder. There's all these things. And uh, first year, sold personally, managed a team, managed a region. We became the top region at Pinnacle, and then grew into a vice president role there and spent five years, met some incredible people. Great run. And then uh, there was a pivot, ended up at Vivint for two years. So, and I want to I yeah. talk about that because you switched from Pinnacle to Vivint, but you guys were such rivals. I mean, that was, yeah. I remember so many people were trying to recruit me because they knew I yeah, had a door to door business and it was right. like, this guy could build, I was very well networked, you know, so I was like, this guy could build a great team. So I had Vivint and Pinnacle always coming, it was Apex at the time, right. but mostly. Yeah, totally. But how did you go from, because you guys hated each other, felt like at least from an outsider's view. How did you go from like this hatred to I'm going to join forces with I them? think I would really it this way uh, Murray and Mountain Crest okay. like like look at the time you're competing then you get together and you're laughing about it yeah, like, you realize sometimes, there's mutual respect, sometimes right? there, there's mutual respect even when you get on the ball field it may be competitive and things might even be said right like mm -hmm. on the ball field that like afterwards somehow you can come together and you can smile about it and you can laugh and I think that's how I would describe the sort of apex pinnacle how it was you're just competing right you're mm -hmm. competing a lot of testosterone and so there's that competition so at the end of the day I think coming together was having some conversations of like look ball players do it all the time they go compete they get traded you know that, that you get on an all-star team or whatever else so um, I think some conversations happen I think feelings get hurt along the way whether you know in, in the spirit of competition but overall I think people mean well even when you're competing, I don't think people wake up and say, how can I hurt this person or how can I get back at them or whatever. I think generally people want to do good. Well, even in real estate, I have, especially when I was calling for sale by owners to build my business, that was like, because there was about 10 of us that did it. Yeah. I mean, in the whole, out of 2,000 agents, there was 10 of us that called for sale That's by it. owners. That was it. That's it. Oh, yeah. That's and we, crazy. We would be walking in the door as they were walking out. I mean, there was about five of us that were really good at it. You know, the Dan Evans of the world and um, you know, Aaron Wagner. There was a few yeah. very good agents at doing for sale by owners. That, and it was funny because on one level, there was this like, oh. But the other, one of my favorite sayings is, uh, every competitor needs a worthy adversary. You need somebody right. to motivate you, For right? Sure. And there was, you know, there was an agent back. He did a lot of deals back in the day. You know, Drew, Mar Drew Armstrong. Uh -huh. I remember one time my aunt wanted me to list her home for sale. I mean, right here in Lehigh, I can probably see it from here, but. And she wanted me to discount my commission like really low. And I said, hey, I don't do that. Like, I'll sell the house, I'll get you the top dollar, but I don't discount my commission. And she goes, well, I'm, I know you're a competitor. I've heard you talk, uh, you know, that yeah. this is one of the main pairs of this guy. And I said, well, go ahead then. And she ended up listing with him just in spite of me and you know and it, you're it, just it, like well, oh. and we were neighbors so I'd see a sign every day it didn't end up selling which was even funny yeah. so then she <laughs> called me she goes hey I want to list with you and I said I just told her you know in my business thankfully I do enough that I don't have to do business with anybody I can choose who I want to do it with and right. I'm good thanks right. though like I yeah. just knew it was going to be a nightmare trying to work with her but it was that adversary like that moment like drove sure. me like it got me out of bed in the mornings knowing oh, these guys were out there pounding the phone for today. sure and so on some level, I give those guys so much um, admiration or so much respect because they kind of helped me build who I was. I, and it was probably a lot drove you guys the same way. I mean, you had to go recruit hard. You had to sell hard because you knew your numbers were going to be compared sure. to those guys. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I think that's, so there was this rival and then suddenly we're on the same team again. And, you know, that was hard at times on the Vivint side and, and suddenly... You know, we found ourselves in the transition getting into legacy and what we're doing today. Man, it was a tough decision uh, to start this and get going with it, and it wasn't super popular. You know, I had a good thing going, was with good people, the lifestyle was good, the income was good, you know, some of that, but something was missing inside. Yeah, you were, because you were comfortable. And this is one yeah, of the, this yeah, is the, like, maybe the most unique part of your story that I admire about you is you drove through the comfortability for greatness. So what was that? What was there something from your past, an experience, or anything that you drew on, or somebody that you idolized, or, or respect that you wanted to be like, or how did you go from such a, because you were comfortable at a very yeah. high level, it wasn't yeah. as comfortable. Yeah, I mean, income was good, right? Like, 
things were good. I, I had a lot of freedom in my schedule, like things that people would say, oh, if I could just have that, that's, that's the life, right? And what happened for me is I read a book. It was like, I can remember, I can remember the book. It was How Will You Measure Your Life by Clayton Christensen. Yeah. It's an awesome book, right? And he talked about something in his book that resonated with me. And it was uh, motivation factors versus hygiene factors. And he talked about how money is just a hygiene factor. Money is only a motivator till your basic needs are met. And then at some point it loses its motivation. And motivation factors are, can you impact? Is your voice being heard and recognized? And are you creating a difference? And are you like all of these things? And I didn't feel like I was contributing to my full level. Mm -hmm. And it just like was stirring in me for months and months to where I was like, man, like, I want to do something. I want to do something bigger and didn't feel like the vehicle that, that I had w was allowing for that. And so at that time, I'm, I started looking around and I started looking at opportunities and solar was like just kind of like getting just going getting and, started, yeah. and uh, solar city was doing well. Solar city went from like eight bucks a share to $80 a share. I started researching it. I looked at them and solar. They'd had some good growth and it was kind of a sister company at the time. And so I looked and, and saw these people having success and I'm like, man, what, it, what I want to understand more. And you start to look into to the energy business. It's a trillion dollar industry. I mean, this is massive. And then the idea of disruptive innovations crept in where I'm like, we're disrupting the utilities. We're disrupting the way that we've produced power for 150 years. And like, it just started turning. I'm like, I have to be a part of this. Like I, I have to be a part of this. And, um, at the time, tried to get involved with them, solar and you know kind of things, and it just it just wasn't working. So I looked into other options, and then Jimmy, I, I was fired and sued. Yeah, I remember you called me because you were like, I, like we, I was buddies with a lot of the you know the yeah, the, I still am very good friends with a lot of the guys that you were partners with there, and all of a sudden it went from like you were one of the top guys, and you called me, you're like, dude, I'm fired, but I, I mean. I didn't want to start this new thing. I, yeah. have, I have to do something. So you had to, I mean, so you basically immediately had to jump into what you were going to do next with, uh, and you just ran with it, right? I mean, tell me a little bit, once you get sued, because that's such a stressful thing to get sued, to get fired, even though you were looking, what was that experience like? And tell me kind of how you dealt with that, how you made your decisions from there going into what is now Legacy Power. It's funny because I remember drawing on past experiences, right, to deal with that, because there you are, now your your income's gone again. That had happened to me before. How did I respond? What happened? There was a way out. So I think I learned there was a, a way out through prior experiences. And then number two, a lawsuit. Like this is something that was foreign to me, right? I hadn't faced this, so how are you gonna do it? And um, that's when I'm like, look, have I done anything wrong? Just because you're sued doesn't mean you've done something wrong. Anybody can sue anybody for anything. But then you have to deal with the defense side of it. Okay, how am I going to defend myself? I feel like I'm innocent. So I feel like I did nothing wrong. I entered, I started a business like Lincoln freed the slaves. Like there's no more, you have to work anything. God bless America, right? Especially I mean, Especially being fired. I mean, you have to go find your income. Yeah, so, so it's like I, I wanted to go. I was in the home security industry. I pivoted industries to the solar industry. So, you know, I felt like the claims yeah, it wasn't were, the were baseless. So... You know, so I jumped in and, and went after it and uh, said, look, I'm just going to defend it and truth will prevail and, and fortunately it did and, and the, the matter's been settled or whatever else. So, but, but nonetheless, it was a trying time and it was a hard and dark time and you know, I think hopefully listeners in some way, shape or form, they face their own lawsuit, whether real or not, but you face hard things and I think the principle here is what are you going to do when things get hard? What are you going to do when things don't go your way? What are you going to do when, when there are obstacles? And I hope it's put your head down and go to work and surround yourself with great people and partner with the right partnerships and build your business with integrity and honesty and go do it and good things happen. So you starting Legacy, I mean, because you've never done solar. I mean, you yeah, have no, no idea what you're doing. So yeah. what, what no. was that? I mean, what did you even do next? What was your, did you go and meet with some of the other solar companies? Were you yep. considering joining one of them, right? Because I know you kind of made a partnership deal or something, but I mean, going from absolutely nothing and knowing very little about that industry to building the largest solar company now, private health solar company in the US, that's a pretty bold 
move, and you made it happen. I mean, well, literally in a pretty short amount of time. I and mean, here we are, four or five years later. Yeah, I mean, the what what did we do? We went out and talked to everybody, and one of the things that I knew, Jimmy, and you'll relate to this a lot. Everything is sales. Everything, all businesses are sales, and sometimes sales gets a bad stigma of shady salespeople or whatever else, but we're selling all the time. I'm selling my kids on why they should make certain choices and sales is everything. Everything. And so I knew I'd sold satellites, I did alarms, I'd seen other people go do solar. So I knew that the sales process and, and understanding the psychology of that was the most important thing that the product, plug and play any product, apply the principles you win. So I knew that. And I knew that the industry needed change. And what it needed was the sales process had to improve and sales technologies needed to improve. And so that's when one of the best decisions I made was partnering with some of the guys that I partnered with. They ran a business called 50 Studio, Russ, Chris, and Grady. They're some of my best friends and business partners now. We came together and said we could do something special. And uh, we have, and we've built these sales enablement tools and technology that allow us to you know, we've got 750 employees across the country in 16 states now. How do you onboard them? How do you manage them? How do you show their analytics? How do you train them? How do you scale to that? How do you do it? Without technology, we couldn't have done it. And so, because yeah, I mean, that's a giant sales force, 750 people that yeah. every day yes. are relying upon the system that you guys create that's it. to go out and make 100%. sales and, and make a living. And so that was the first call was to these guys and said, we can do something special. So. That's what's driven and fueled a lot of the success, coupled with other partners that I brought on board. Um, Luke Toon, one of the co-founders with me, um, brought him on. He really understood solar and the sales process and had done it, so we brought Luke on. And then others, and you know, all of our core leaders are considered partners and owners of this business. So we've created alignment and compensation. I think that's important. They have some equity in the actual Correct. Yeah. company. Correct, yeah. Yeah, and so we've created that alignment, and I think that's those have been critical pieces in, in driving it to success. And now you know, we've taken this technology, we said, look, this, this works really well for our business. It's helped us have incredible growth. I wonder if other sales companies, not just door to door, but field salespeople, business to business, salespeople, business to consumer salespeople, could they use technologies to better their business? You know, in, in Good to Great, it talks about technology accelerators. Mm -hmm. The good companies took these technology accelerators to become great, and we've applied that, and we've now started generating revenue in an entirely new business as well, um, where we've got these sales enablement tools, and it's so exciting where we can impact any company that sells anything in a massive way to drive more revenue. Um, so, so it's pretty exciting. Because the system was so well set up, you're able to now sell the actual system itself to other sales Correct. industries? Correct. Would you sell it to other like solar companies or is it more outside of the solar industry that you sell the product? We are right now. Are we're, you? we're actually uh, selling it to some of our competitors and allowing them to white label our technology and use some of our technology as if it's their own. Well, and in a way, a lot of what you guys are doing um, it's industry. It's interesting because solar, you guys have competition amongst each other as far as solar companies, but you kind of have to work together to fight the other industries, which is traditional power and some of For these sure. giant utility monopolies and things, right? So do you work? Do you feel like your other solar companies are more competitors or more allies in the fight? So Greg Butterfield, uh, one of my mentors, he was the old CEO at Vivint Solar. He's joined us as chairman of the board, mm -hmm. and he's CEO of our technology business. And Greg, one of the words that he used from an incredible career that this guy has had, taken five companies to over a billion dollars in value, Utah technology pioneers, just done some amazing things, and learning from some of his scar tissue, one of the words he uses is, is coopetition. Mm -hmm. And I love it. It's... Yeah, we're competitive, but we're cooperating and you kind of bring it together, coopetition. And so I would say we've approached it that way where how can we join as allies in some regards, yet we're going to compete and how do you maintain, uh, you know, maintain that? And I, I think as a whole, the industry's done okay, but I would love to see more of that and, and hopeful that, that as the industry evolves, we can, we can really drive more of the, no, the competition. I, I like that. It's kind of been funny because recently there's been some technology companies in real estate that have come on the scene, right? And I just look at them as a, a worthy competitor. Just Homie? One, like, yeah, yeah they're one of them. there's three or four. <laughs> sure, there's yeah. three or four main ones. And in Utah, it's different than it is in, say, Arizona or Interesting. California. Yeah, 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 there's right. these different companies in every area. But realtors, 
um, really are having to work together more than ever, and it kind of right. creates some of that cooperation or whatever you call yeah. it. Cooperation. There you go. Yeah. And uh, it's been interesting to see because. You know, I more than ever the top agents. We've always had to work together because every transaction you have two agents, right. and if you're just a complete punk to everybody in the industry, well, nobody's going to want to work with you, right? And I think one of my biggest advantages that I carry in the industry is I know all these other agents, and we have this respect for each other. Um, I love you know a lot of these competitors that I work with um, on a daily basis. You know, in my own office, any other agent that's selling a lot of homes can be seen as a, as a competitor, but yet we work together on deals and it's knowing them and having that relationship that when there's 10 offers on a property in a market like right now, I get my offer accepted because of that relationship. We, you know, they can basically, it, it helps in so many ways to get the transaction to go through. Yeah, relationship management is key, and clearly you've been able to do that in your business. And look at any any successful people; they're able to manage those relationships, right? And and in sensitive situations, be able to do that. So you guys are in sixteen states. Is I mean, is it going to be able to get to all fifty states? Or you just fight government over and over. I know in utility, um, how much of your time is spent trying to open new markets as an industry, and how much of it is spent specifically just with what you're already managing? Yeah, I mean, you th you think about it, right? Most states, you get your energy from one location. I mean, it's, it's all regulated. Uh, 44 states are regulated in, in how they get their power. And so you come in and say, hey, we're going to change this up. You get a lot of pushback, right, um, from these, these utility companies. But it's, it's been so fun to come in and just disrupt that and come in and, and fight it. But, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of time is spent, a lot of money is spent in lobbying efforts and trying to understand the political side of things. I mean... You know, to use Nevada for an example, we were there, they shut, they shut it down, the, you know, kind of politicians and the Public Utilities Commission got involved and, and uh, we got a negative outcome. Then a series of events, we end up back in there. So, so yeah, it's, it's a little volatile, state by state, utility by utility, we face that. And we believe that consumer choice will win in the end. Mm. We really hope that, you know, you think of burning coal and this dirty way of doing it versus put panels on your roof and instead of sending power from here in Utah to California, like it shines on your roof and goes eight feet into the house or whatever. Well, I mean, you guys just got a huge boost. I know I saw your stock just went up like 16% through the roof. It was awesome. Yesterday. Yeah, it was awesome. Right? Yep. Um, it's probably a good day for you. Yeah. Uh, is that because there's so much, um, there's so many people behind the solar movement, I guess at this point, eventually it seems like it has to win out for the earth to do what it needs to do. That's just it. I think, I think that Wall Street has seen it as a lot of companies have failed. This is a difficult business. Yeah. I mean, Sun Edison, gone. Solar City, bleeding cash. Tesla bails them out. There's even questions there. Uh, Sungevity, bankrupt, gone. NRG, huge company. NRG, gone, out of it. So it's like, can people actually execute this at scale? It's very, very, very difficult. And I think Sunrun stock has, has just seen a, a significant uptick. uptick because of their consistency along the way and making good business decision, not chasing volume at all costs, but, but chasing volume with profitability so their numbers have looked good. So I think it's the execution on the one hand. Couple that with, um, you know, in, in California, they just mandated in 2020, by 2020, every new home will have to have solar. Yeah, I saw that. Okay. So, I mean, uh, so it's interesting to, to look at that and see how, how state by state, utility by utility, it's evolving. Well, and I think solar is just as a summer sales type industry, because it's not really summer sales anymore. You guys are year-round. And I think that's one of the advantages that you have is that people can actually set up a life and live in yes. the city wherever they are. But I know a lot of younger people listen to my podcast because they reach out to me. Right, a lot. Yep. And um, let's say there's a 20 year old kid, 21 year old kid, he's listening to the podcast right now. Why legacy power over all the options you have to go out and sell? Yeah, I think there are a lot of great options, right? A lot of, you can go be successful in a variety of different companies. I have been, so they can. Sure. So I don't think there's one true company. Like, I, I don't buy into that. Um, I think why legacy? Number one, summer sales is a grind. So, like, Summer sales is one of the most ridiculously hard things that anybody can ever do. I, uh, no, I, like, I like five it, hours on the doors is like eleven hours doing anything else. And, like, and during the summers, I mean, these these summer sales guys that maybe it's looked on. Oh, you're a door to door salesman. What is this? What they go through? I mean, the rejection that you go through, the hot days, 
the you're, you're dripping sweat from being outside. I mean, it is so hard. And the lifestyle that you do year after year after year, take your family out there, take your kids out there. It's the untold story that nobody wants to talk about because yeah, you it's not to, good for you have to uproot your family for four yeah. months. Or if you're single, it pretty much puts a complete kibosh on any momentum you have going with anybody for about four or five months. And the sales force, they've made a certain amount of money and they're kind of like got these handcuffs into a certain level of income. So then they can't get out of it. And what happened in the summertime? My kids are out of school. So my, my kids are doing fun things. You want to go to the lake. You've got a family reunion. You've got all these different things. And now suddenly it's like, no, dad's out knocking doors in Arkansas. We're at home. No, we're going to travel and meet him. Like, how's that dynamic going to work? And it causes real pressure on a family. And so to the summer salesman, I would, see, I would say, like, that's just a feeder program, like the NBA D League into the NBA. Like, come have a career. Um, selling solar is more like a real estate agent sure. or an insurance agent, you live in a community, you live year round, you have a balance to your life instead of this like sprint, stop, sprint, stop lifestyle that's tough on a family. So to them I'd say, I think it's the lifestyle and then and then the culture. I think the tools, technology, culture, um, how we treat people, uh, the salespeople here, I've had multiple people say, hey, you're not a, they're not, your top sales guys aren't bros. You know, and, and, you know, there's, we joke about the Provo All-Star, like there's, you know, this thing that, that happens of a certain stigma, but we have women that sell for us. We have, uh, you know, a 70 year old gentleman that sells for us. We have all ages, all walks of life that sell because this really can be a career. So to anybody out there, come have a career with a great culture, with great technology, with a great company where we, we care about people. Yeah. Um, our mission is, is to create an extraordinary customer experience while becoming the best version of ourselves and helping others do the same. So it's how do we become? I, I love that. It's more of an actual life as opposed to just a temporary moment in your life, I think. Correct. But So let me ask you this. You talked about the hardships of going out and doing some sales and building these companies. That, I mean, you did this and you've gotten to a point now where obviously it was worth it. There's no way I'm sure you would have it any other way. But um, is, is there anything you feel like maybe you had to sacrifice or I obviously sacrificed a ton to be able to do this, but is there anything maybe you would have done differently or you would have done instead of the summer sales route had you never had the success that you did right away? Man, there are so many things I would have done different and so many things that I've sacrificed. Um, to, and to somebody that's younger too, like dive into that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think that for somebody that's younger listening in, I would just say, uh, you know, number one, like you have to pay the price for success. Like you have to put in the work in any industry, summer sales or otherwise. And Sometimes right now I feel like people want success without having to pay the price and they, and they don't realize that sacrifice does have to be made. Um, what I should have done earlier in my career is help my wife to understand my why. Mm -hmm. I always knew my why that it was my family, but I didn't always communicate that to her until later in my career where I was out at Lake Powell and I said, honey, let's talk about our why together and my why and why I do things. It, it's a hard time. That's like, actually such, hard a, that's such a great point because I think you were motivated. You, you understood the struggle and the why it was worth it, but maybe the, to your why, she said, what is he getting from this? Why does he want to Yeah, I, I wish I would have sat her down and, and really just sat and connected emotionally and said, honey, this is what I want for our kids. This is what I want for our family. This is the quality of lifestyle that, that we want to have. And in order to get that, there's going to be some sacrifices. And these are some of those things and laid it out more clearly than just thinking that naturally she understood that was my motivation. And I think had I done that earlier, I think she would have been more aligned with me as opposed to thinking maybe I'm prioritizing work over family and creating tension in the marriage. And so that's like, that's one like main thing looking back, I would have altered and I have, and my marriage has been far better as a result than a stronger relationship. But I had to go through hard, hard times yeah. and challenging situations with that. But with, with the, with the summer sales, was there some moments when, I mean, it was just so hard on your, is there any examples of like some times when maybe oh, yeah. you were out there and something you could, Oh, dude, for sure. I remember specifically 2008, I've lost everything. I move to Portland, Oregon. Okay. My wife's pregnant with our second and uh, she comes out to visit on the 4th of July. 4th of July is her birthday, right? It's her birthday, the 4th of July. 4th of July, you should be celebrating. Everybody's having barbecues. And guess what I was doing? Knocking doors. 
big incentive, go time, it's a holiday, honey, you don't understand, like, we gotta do this, this is her birthday, bro, like, I, I'm like, I am crazy person, this sounds nuts, but at the time, like, for whatever reason, yeah, guys, gotta go get it, gotta go celebrate, sales day, everybody's home, and, and, like, man, looking back, I'm like, holy smokes, like, that's crazy, that's crazy, sure. but the sacrifice, I had to pay the price, had to go do some of those things, but, again, um, man, along the journey that, that that was hard that was hard for my family that was hard on her it's hard on us and now looking back a little bit I would have helped explain that why bring it together and, and uh, probably probably take an approach the day it, off approach to, it, uh, to approach it right your wife yeah. and everybody would have understood you know <laughs> sure yeah I remember one when I was building my career I was probably two or three years in and I mean the market had gotten tough and, and it was like you know, you were you were really pounding the phones at that point. For me, it was the phones. Right. It was Thanksgiving, and I had this streak. I had a calendar, and every day I put a red X on the day that man I prospected, and I prospected yep. every day but Sunday, right? Yep. And I had this streak going, and I was like hell bent on not letting it break, even though it was Thanksgiving. So my family went, went and got up, and we did like a turkey bowl and everything, and then I go into the room for like an hour and a half to make my phone calls. And I remember my family just like, what is he doing? What is he like, yeah. what, what is this? And I remember every person I called was like, dude, really? Like, you know, like, that's seriously, right? Yeah. And I realized after, like, normally I call for three hours, but I realized about halfway through, I'm like, okay, this is actually probably a bad thing. Maybe, like, maybe I, I've I, got a step too far. Yes. Like, and it was the balls first, consistency. It was that first time I was like, all right, because I do believe in life. Like, uh, you know, you talk about balance all the time. I think that balance is the most important thing, but I think it's very important to be strategically unbalanced in certain areas at certain times. For sure. There's a time when you have to strategically be very unbalanced in business if you want to build something great, but then you have to be strategically unbalanced in you know whatever spirituality or your family and right. those different things. Even when you're on vacation, I you know I hate like people. Are, I have an agent on my team. She was going to Hawaii for a year and or a year a week just recently. And she's like, well, I'll make my calls every day. So look, I'd rather you go to Hawaii and don't make a single call. Like be go be there, have fun, be refreshed, and then come back and let's hit and be all in. Yeah. yeah, be all in where you are. I love so it. with the off seasons, this is one thing that I always thought about when you were back in those days. Um, how did you stay motivated to get hyped up for another? Because I was curious about this because it's such a grind when you're on those doors and you get done. It's almost probably like finishing yeah. your mission, right? You're just like so relieved oh, that the last day is done. How do you get yourself motivated over and over again? How does somebody in life get motivated over and over again to do that hard thing? Yeah, I think the lesson that I've learned is, you know, to be motivated, it's like, what does it take to be motivated? All of those things, it really boils down to your why. Why are you doing it? What are your goals? You know, it's like, why were you motivated to call on Thanksgiving? Like, that's crazy, right? But at some point you have to set your goals, you have to stick to them and learn that discipline. I'm a big believer in discipline over being motivated. I think it's like, okay, great, the motivation's going to wear off. There were times I didn't want to knock doors, but I had to continue. And that's where the discipline really sets in if I'm disciplined for my goals and that supersedes the actual motivation. Motivation gives you that start. Discipline yeah. drives you to the to the success. Oh, I love that. My mentor, um, one of my first, first mentors, Mike Ferry, used to say the difference between successful and unsuccessful people is successful people have merely learned to do the things that unsuccessful people don't want to do. There you go. That's more discipline. Yeah. That's, that's the discipline of it. That's, yeah. It doesn't matter. And I used to say to people, I was like, I just look at it as this is my job. My job is to do this thing every day. Yep. And it doesn't matter. It's not optional. When you take away the choice, yes. it doesn't matter anymore, right? right? You're going to do the thing. Right. The definition of, of uh, discipline, giving up momentary pleasure for lasting value. Ooh, you know, it's the momentary pleasure. You want that lasting value. Stay, stay disciplined. So don't stay motivated. Stay disciplined. No, I love that. Well, uh, last question I want to kind of end up with is you guys have built this thing so fast. Seriously, it's been cool to watch. Oh, thanks, the man. Thanks. I, I remember because you called me. I was in the airport, and you're like, dude, we're going to be open up some different areas. You're like, is one you're of them. crazy. Like, I, I want you. And I literally remember thinking, I was like, man, like he's going to build this thing from scratch. And so many companies had, had tried this like one-offs and kind of got sure. I just assumed it was another one of those. I didn't know you well enough to know. I mean, I knew that you'd had this giant success, but it was like, I remember just thinking, like, man, good luck, dude. I, I'll be cheering for you, but yeah. I don't think it's gonna work. <laughs> yeah. So it's really cool to be sitting here and, and seeing what you guys have built. But what's next for? What's your? I guess what's your vision for what Legacy Power is and becomes? 
Yeah, you know, it's been really fun to impact lives, right? And that's been our mission all along is how can we impact more lives? How can we help more people? How can we help people become the best version of themselves? That, that for me, is the motivator. That's the driving force. Money becomes the byproduct of creating value. I really believe that. So how can we create more value for more people? We're going to continue to scale in multiple states and multiple cities. We're going to continue to grow our sales force. You know, we, we have a couple channels now. We have our direct sales people. We have an inside, uh, inside sales you know, call center going. We have retail, so we're in the Home Depots in the Northeast. So we're expanding our sales channels and we'll continue to expand our product mix. Again, we're, we are more of a sales and customer acquisition company on a, on a platform of sales tools. And so it won't just be solar only. How can we provide more value to customers inside the home? So we're excited to launch additional product lines inside of it. And then the second phase of this other business, I'm so excited about it. Uh, Jimmy, we are doing some really fun things on the, on the technology side. We've brought on um, Larry H. Miller Auto Group. We brought in you know different segments to impact you know sales companies and help drive uh, you know. More, better sales performance through automation and, and through technology. So um, big things come in there. That's cool and it's very scalable, both of those are. So, I mean, you literally, we might be looking back in 10 years and laugh at this was the beginning, you know, yeah, of everything. For sure. That's very cool. And then a personal question is, you're you're very good at building teams and leaders and things like that. I'm not so good at that. That's not a strength of mine. I don't buy it. Not like you, no, no, I'm serious about this. And so do you have a mentor or books that you've read that you would recommend? Because this is something that I think is just so valuable and you do this as well as anyone. So. Yeah, you know, my a mentor that I have, um, you're a mentor of mine. Um, seriously appreciate what you do and the influencers that you have. And I look to you in a lot of ways of what you're doing. I mean, look, you've got, you're not, not a leader. You've got what, 10,000 podcast subscribers and more like you're, you're doing it. You just don't give yourself credit. Uh, but I, I think it's, you know, how do you build a team? How do you grow a team? What books do you read? I, I think just continue to surround yourself with great people. Um, continue to find mentors. Everybody is your superior in at least one way. Um, stop thinking that you you know everything and learn something from everybody. And once you've done that, I think you're onto something. I think that life and progression is is something that's constant. We'll continue to be growing and developing and learning. And I hope that's our quest. And if you make that your quest, all of a sudden doors open up, windows open up, and there's an amazing world out there with opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. So. Excited to see what you do, man. I love what to do and all, all the great we'll things. We'll do another one in a few years when we're uh, both awesome. uh, wherever we are in five years. I like it. We'll, it, we'll, it we'll talk back about uh, Murray High School in <laughs> 1999. Yeah. I love it, man. Thanks, Thanks man. Uh, all right, appreciate it. Yeah. All right.